The story of One Piece ventures through some wonderful worlds of fantasy, but one of the most logic-defying, jaw-dropping locations is the government stronghold of Annie's Lobby. And I love that it not only evokes awe and fear, but that it's one of those settings that wholly matches the tone of the plot, and has subconsciously used some staple engineering concepts to elaborate that tone. So that's this video, a structural engineer's review of Annie's Lobby. For the next few minutes, so we'll discuss the why, the how, the lessons to learn, structurally of course. Feel free to skip around with timestamps if you want them. So Luffy and the Straw Hats encounter Annie's Lobby at the end of the long Water 7 saga, and my energy for recaps is running low, so I'll truncate out the parts that don't directly contribute. Annie's Lobby is one of three islands that make up a government stronghold on the Grand Line, so it shouldn't be surprising that when the Straw Hat pirate crew arrives there on the sea train, that they're in disarray. Robin is in the custody of the world government, Usopp has gone missing after beefing with the Straw Hat himself, and their trusty ship, the Going Merry, has been condemned, never to sail again. Overall, their standing is just precarious. The quest for the One Piece is nearly forgotten. Without a ship or a full crew, Luffy's journey to be the Pirate King seems over. Sure, they've made some new friends like Frankie, Polly, and the mysterious Soga King, but now at the steps of the world government, they're out on the farthest limbs to save their crewmate. Which is why the first piece of the environment is so intriguing, because Annie's Lobby isn't like any island we've encountered before. It doesn't poke up out of the sea or even rest on a super cumulonimbus cloud. It uh, sort of floats above a hole in the ocean? So there is a lot of YouTube theorizing about what's going on here and how something like this could even exist, much of it obviously consisting of supernatural explanations, and those are aided by the fact that Annie's Lobby also never experiences nighttime. The sun never sets there, it's just clear that different rules apply. Which might make it an odd subject for the rigid logical basis of engineering investigation, same with One Piece in general, but its fantastic nature is precisely why it's so interesting. When we first see this hole in the ocean, just like when Frankie pokes his head out over the edge, we lose our minds. It's insane and makes absolutely no sense. Even a toddler looks at this and thoughtfully reflects to herself. It does not make sense! But why is that? Uh, now bear with me, it's not as obvious as it seems. Outside of the whole hole in the ocean thing, I just want to focus on the seemingly absurd floating islands. I'd expect the response most people would come up with is that it doesn't look stable or structurally sound. To invoke our thoughtful toddler, or just any toddler, why? Now, why doesn't the island look stable? Again, uh, layman answers could sound like there's nothing beneath it or holding it up, but that's not totally satisfying. There's lots of examples of buildings that seem to defy gravity. That's kind of a structural engineer's job. Uh, so I could say that there's a small land bridge connecting it back to another part of the island. Uh, why can't that hold it up? And finally, this layman I've made up breaks his keyboard, hammering out, it's too small, you Okay, okay. You've been hurt, my imaginary friend. I agree, it's too small. But too small to do what? And I'll spare him the aneurysm and just answer myself, since that's all I was doing anyway. So. The land bridge is too small to take the weight of the island of Annie's Lobby back to the supporting islands over here. That is what most structural engineers would describe as a load path taking applied loads from anywhere on a superstructure and getting it all the way to solid ground. And it's one of the cornerstone methods for assessing a structural system. So let's do that for Annie's Lobby, because I want to. So here's an adequate diagram for the islands. What, don't believe me? Oh, fine, I'll color it in for you. As noted before, there's nothing beneath it, and the only support is the little island near the front gate. And this generally mimics what most engineers would call a cantilever. It's a very common configuration and is essentially what each of the buildings I flashed up on the screen before had to use in order to satisfy a valid load path. So we put some loads on here, buildings, marines, the way to the island itself, and all that has to get back to the support. Granted, even that main gate island would be subject to a load path analysis of transferring its internal forces through the rock or soil substrates, but that deviates a bit from the topic. I'm sure we'll cover foundations more at some point. Now, something else worth addressing about these loads is that they all point down. Now, why is that interesting? Well, that's the direction that gravity pulls, right? And I only mention that because it's been posed by some commenters on the topic that there could be some variation in gravitational accelerations that helps keep the island stable, but the fact that none of the Straw Hats experienced this, and it's like not indicated in any way, it, well, it just wouldn't seem to validate that view. At this point, I, I know, I'm nitpicking, but I did want to address that, and if gravity was acting differently, our loads would have to account for that in magnitude or direction. That's why the industry jargon is gravity loads. 
So for the main island, in order to have a valid load path, each element of the structure needs to be able to transfer the load back to the support. But how does it do that? Well, the loads impart internal forces to the structure, or the island, uh, which for this case are shear and bending. I've graphed a rough diagram of the magnitude of these internal forces along the length as the load accumulates on its path back to the support. So here you can see it makes sense that they would be at their maximum, and if we knew the constitution of the island, we could determine determine if these maximum shear forces exceed the shear capacity, and likewise if the bending force, also called bending moment, exceeded the bending capacity, uh, unique to the island's material and shape. If the capacity is exceeded, uh, the load path wouldn't be valid. Now, I don't think we have good enough reference from the source material to stab at quantifying it, and we just all have to be okay with that. Now, stepping back a little bit, we've more or less have gone over the literal textbook response for why the Straw Hat's adventure to Eni's lobby is precarious in plot and environment. <laughs> I'm in danger! Just as there doesn't seem to be a path to victory for the Straw Hats, there doesn't seem to be a path for the load of the islands to resolve itself. My best guess is that there is some unknown force pulling up on the island itself, whether magnetic, gravitational, that's unclear. It could have something to do with the perennial sunlight. What do you think the in-world logic that explains Annie's lobby is? Uh, leave that down in the comments. But the island itself isn't the only precarious element of the environment. Once they cross over from the main islands to the Tower of Justice, where the Straw Hats engage in battle with the CP9 members, one of them, a big giraffe, slices the tower in half with a wild spinning kick. And as their fights continue, whenever a large attack makes contact anywhere on the island, the vibrations shimmy the upper half of the tower down along this inclined plane. Again, I love this use of the built environment to convey tone. So as the fights around the building continue, there's this sense that the reader gets that the building might collapse, something might fall, and again, the Straw Hat's quest is in peril. And again, there's a precarious load path, though this instance is a bit different. The simplest parallel is something you might learn in a high school physics course, a, a block on an inclined plane held in place by friction. See here, the forces that apply along the interface, they, they consist of the weight of the structure, the normal force reaction perpendicular to the incline, and the friction force. And these all have to sum up to be equal and opposite thanks to Newton's third law. Otherwise, something starts moving. For the case of the Tower of Justice, the incline is low enough that the horizontal components of the normal force is small enough to be counteracted by that friction. You see, the friction force is directly proportional to the weight above and has a maximum possible value depending on the two materials at the interface. If this building were made of, say, Teflon, there would be little friction resistance, or maybe if the draft man had sliced the building at a greater angle, that might have been enough to drop the top, so to speak. So while a structural designer doesn't usually rely solely on friction to transfer consequential loads, unless we're talking about uh, friction piles, uh, pretension bolts, or you know what, never mind. Uh, point is, we're, we're still able to draw out the load path. To add a couple more comments on the system, uh, while the Tower of Justice looked to be on the verge of toppling for many chapters on end, statically speaking, the upper half wouldn't have been in too much danger of falling until the center of mass tipped beyond the edge of the lower half. I prefaced with the statically speaking because the structural system seems to be either stone or unreinforced concrete, which uh, defy some structural logic, and that's all right. Uh, see, uh, Oda has this habit of drawing structural systems as basically being being made of homogeneous material, just like a, a rock or something, instead of actual bricks or steel or what have you, which is totally fair. I'm not criticizing him for that. It's probably easier to draw while still being somewhat realistic and conveying the idea of destruction. It's clearly good enough to only be recognized by nitpicking nerds. So, have I killed the joke? Did engineer explaining this whimsical element of an albeit very cartoonish show take the fun out of it for you? I hope not. If anything, I hope it just serves to reinforce the mysticism, uh, preserve the wonder. Anyways, uh, that's a structural engineer's take on One Piece's Annie's Lobby. I, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have thoughts on other pieces of world building, uh, please leave it down in the comments. While you're there, uh, tap that subscribe button while you're at it. Thanks, and adios.